So good morning, good afternoon, welcome everybody here. Uh, I could not be more excited to be, uh, have Dr. Ellen here with us. And today is going to be a really interesting topic in our DIRCON A insight where we understand the function of DIRCON A in uh, embryonic development. I'm extra curious to know all the details about it and thank you Helen uh, to be with us. Before we get uh, started, there's some um, housekeeping here. Everybody got mute on entry, but you do have um, the power to unmute yourself. So feel free at uh, any time to participate. Uh, Helen already like shared that she is here to answer uh, all of questions, so we can uh, keep them going, uh, keeping them coming. The webinar is being recorded, as everybody heard uh, in the beginning of the call, and we are going to post in our YouTube channel and also in our uh, website. There's an area uh, in the website, dearquanae.org now, with all the past uh, Dearquanae insights. Always stay present, enjoy, have some fun. Just as some uh, reminders here, uh, here's some of like how we are connecting with all of you. So the Dear Kwan Insight that you are here right now, we have um, every quarter. So every three months, you can expect to have uh, us reach out with some different topic. It's an, we are welcome suggestions of topics that we can uh, go ahead and try to, to schedule for all of you. We have also once a quarter the Dirk A family chat. That's the chance to connect with other families, um, get to know a little bit of each other, and also like exchange ideas and things that work for for our kids. I think with being a rare a rare syndrome is always good that we are learning from each other when they have a chance to um, share best practice and things that have worked for our kids. We have once a month our Dear Kwanae Digest is an email that you receive with like latest news and things that are happening all around our community. Uh, also have like uh, a blog that that comes once a month. So two things: if you don't receive that yet, go our website dearkwanae.org and um, get yourself uh, registered to receive. Is a really uh, nice uh, way to be connected and to get some some news and also hear in the blogs from like other families. The same way, if you want to share your perspective, if you want to uh, be a voice in the digest, um, reach out to us. You'll be uh, happy to um, get you in one of the blogs and share your story. Get connected in social media. Um, we have our group on Facebook. Uh, we are in the Instagram. So join us. Uh, share your perspective as always. And we have also our Dear Kone bonfire store that you can uh, get some nice t-shirts with like Dear Kone theme um, to raise awareness around the your friends, your family, and also help us um, with some uh, fundraising. With that, I'm going to get you with Dr. Helen Wilson. Um, she's a PAD is the development of neuroscience, working to understand the molecular mechanism underlying autism spectrum disorders as a postdoctoral fellow in the Laboratory of Mouth State uh, at the UCSF, uh, well, Institute of Neuroscience. Dr. Wilson received a bachelor's degree in biology and the Edward C. Horn Memorial Prize from Duke University in 2009. She received a PAD in genetic and Caroline is Lehman Prize from Yale University in 2015. During her postdoctoral work, Dr. Wilson has developed a Xenopus frog model system to understand how autism risk genes function during brain development and a method to find the small molecules that counter these effects. This novel approach provides a path for understanding disorders like autism and defy potential therape therapeutics in high throughput manner. So I'm extra curious to understand more of the frog model. And with that, um, the floor is yours, Dr. Ellen. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Anna. And thank you um, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I'm really excited about it. And and like Anna said, I'm I 
I would love to answer so many questions and, and I, I view this not only as an opportunity to tell you about what we've been working on in the laboratory, but also to learn from all of you. Um, so I think um, the more you want to interrupt me, the better. Um, that is definitely a goal of mine is to have this really be a, a back and forth. So feel free to interrupt, put things in the chat, uh, whatever you feel comfortable with. Okay, so today, um, you know, like like Anna said, I really focus on autism genetics, um, and that's how I got interested in Dirk one a So autism is one of the high confidence. Um, uh, Dirk one a is one of the high confidence autism genes, um, and so that's why I first started studying it. And, but as I started studying, I started to understand um, more of the roles of what it's playing during embryonic development, and have focused a lot of my research on that idea. So what I want to share with you today are, are two things. First is what we've done in, uh, in understanding the function of Dirk one a in cells and organs during embryonic development, so before birth. And also some work we've done doing drug screening to try to understand if we can understand a little bit more about what Dirk one a is doing and how you may be able to counter some of those effects using drugs. And of course, we do this using frogs. Um, so that may be a little bit um, different than what people are used to hearing about in the context of, of model organism work. And so before I jump into any of the research we've done on Dirk 1A, what I want to tell you about is why we are using frogs. Um, so uh, of course, what we're most interested in is, is humans. Um, of course, we, we love thinking about ourselves and our development. Um, but of course, for many different reasons, it's not accessible to be studying uh, embryonic development in humans. And so instead, um, over many years, people use a wide variety of model organisms to try to understand the human condition. And of course, many people are probably aware that a lot of researchers use mice um, as they are very close in the evolutionary tree with humans. And today I'm going to tell you um, about why we're using frogs. Um, and so you may be surprised to hear that actually the development of a frog embryo aligns very nicely with a human embryo. A lot of the same stages of development, you can line them up between frogs, chickens, mice, and humans. This stage here is a stage called gastrulation, where the, the cells in the very early embryo are moving around. And there's also other stages here where actually all these embryos kind of look like a tadpole. You know, even at this stage, a human embryo has a tail. And so what we can do is start to understand how the frog develops and uh, come up with ideas about how that may be happening in the human embryo. And then of course, validate that that's true. Um, now in the context of Dirk 1A, one thing I wanna show you is that the actual sequence, so the DNA that becomes protein sequence, is very, very similar between humans and frogs. And so what I'm showing here is this top line of all of these is the amino acid or the protein sequence in the human Dirk 1A protein. And I've aligned that, and the, so the bottom line here is the frog sequence of the Dirk 1A protein. And everywhere where these letters are red, it means it's identical between the frog version of the gene and the human version of the gene. And so this is a remarkable amount of conservation or similarity between the human and frog versions of this gene. And so that tells you that the function of this gene is likely to be conserved between frogs and humans, is that understanding what Dirk 1A does in the frog can lead us to ideas about what it's doing in the human. There are also a lot of just technical reasons why frogs are a really nice model system to study genetics. Um, again, their DNA is very similar to that of humans for many of these genes. But what's really nice from an experimental point of view is that one pair of frogs, there's a male and there's a female, will lay over 4,000 embryos in an afternoon and we can manipulate each one of those embryos. So for example, in one afternoon, we can get 4,000 embryos and in each one of them inhibit Dirk 1A and then watch and see what happens. And then again, um, what's nice is because you have so many and they're aquatic, we can do drug screening on top of this to try to understand what different small molecules will do to that effect of manipulating Dirk 1A. So here's what a typical day in the lab looks like for me. Here's a pair of mating frogs. Each one of these little dots is an embryo and we can watch it. And this is a time-lapse video I took watching all those first cell divisions of, of embryonic development 
right from fertilization all the way, we can watch them all the way until they're swimming, tadpole, behaving, moving around, social behaviors. Um, and so this is a really remarkable model system to understand what genes do during development and then to do drug screening to try to modify that or change it a bit. Okay, so the other really cool thing about frogs, uh, which was one of the main driver of why I chose it for my autism project, is because we can make half mutant tadpoles. So because we can catch embryos where they've just done that first cell division, so now instead of one cell, they're at the two cell stage, and we can physically take a needle and inject what's called CRISPR, which I'm sure a lot of people have heard about in the news, but it's this revolutionary technology where we can actually go in and, and mutate one gene of interest and have it be very specific and very controlled. And in this case, and what's specific to frogs is that this cell stays on the right side of the body and this cell stays on the left side of the body. And so then what happens is once it becomes a free swimming, behaving, eating tadpole, all the cells on the right half of the tadpole have a mutation of interest. And uh, you can compare that to the other side of the tadpole that does not have that change and really start to understand what happened when that gene was mutated. So that's a big advantage of frogs and that you really can't do in mice, chickens, any other model organism. Okay, so this is an example of what that looks like when we mutate a gene involved in eye pigmentation. And so you can probably guess that is this half of the tadpole where it carries the mutation for um, an eye pigmentation gene. And so what you'll see here is an albino eye on the mutated side. And there's the, the, the side that has not been manipulated that still has pigmentation on the eye. So you can do this half and half comparison. That's really um, an advantage for understanding what genes do during embryonic development. These tadpoles are also exceptionally beautiful. This is sustaining to be able to look at all of the neurons in the entire head. And what's nice is that we can already just see, just with a microscope, different regions of the, of the central nervous system. So we can see the forebrain, the midbrain, the hindbrain. This is the nose, the eyes, a lot of sensory nerves, the ears, the kidneys are down here, the vagal nerve. And so just by looking at the animals, we can go ahead and get an idea of what this gene does by comparing one half to the other. Now, a lot of my research is about the brain, which is this green part here, but of course, these animals have all the other organs too, right? So we can study the brain with this method. We can look at eyes, the nose, we can look at the kidneys, we can look at the gut, we can look at the heart, we can look at muscles, uh, all in one animal where we have an internal reference point to compare to since only one half of the animal has been mutated. I mean, so then, you know, you've probably heard a lot of people talking about stem cell models for understanding genes, um, which are highly informative, but I think a real unique advantage to studying frogs is that we can look at all of these organ systems and understand how they influence each other and get a, a broader picture of what these genes do during development. Okay, so now that hopefully I've shown you why we've chosen frogs, I wanna talk a little bit about what we've done so far and really only in the last four years to understand what Draconi does during embryonic development. And so oftentimes the first thing we do when we're thinking about what a gene does is you think, well, where and when is Dirk Wang actually turned on? What tissues are actually relevant and when during embryonic development? Um, and so of course, um, you know, in every cell um, in a typically developing embryo, there, there is the Dirk Wang gene, but not all cells actually turn it on. And so we use um, a technique called in situ hybridization, it doesn't matter, where we can actually look and see where this gene is on. And so what you'll see here is these are um, different embryos at different stages of development. So these are really young, and these are about at the stage of um, that maps on to human birth. And so everywhere where you see purple in these embryos is where drg one is on. And so this is a really early embryo, one of those gastrulous stages where the cells are all really moving around and deciding what tissue they're going to become. And you can see a, a large expression of Dirk Wenning kind of throughout the embryo on the sides. And now this embryo um, has structures that are going to become the brain and the eye. And so here's the head and here's what's going to become the tail. And this is the skin and the spinal cord. And you can see Dirk Wenning is widely expressed throughout the central nervous system and the skin. A little bit later, which is more kind of maps on kind of the first trimester development of, of human uh, embryology, 
you can see now that JERK1A is um, expressed in a lot of the early uh, organ systems. So here is the developing kidney, which is called the pronephros in the frog. We can see strong activation of JERK1A expression or JERK1A is on in the kidney. We can see it's really highly on in the brain. And we can see it in the ear and the eye and also in the pharyngeal arches, which become the craniofacial structure of the head and also the, the heart. Um, and so then we can look a little bit later and what we see is, yes, yeah, still strong expression in the brain, especially in this um, region called the ventricle, which is where all the cells that are dividing are. So kind of the neural stem cells of the brain. And then also again, in the ear, in the eye, um, you can't see it here, but also in the kidney. And it stays on um, in the brain um, up to birth and, and even beyond. I saw something come through with a with a question, but I can't find it. <laughs> do you want to stop as we go, or should we, how do you want to? So, it? Yes, I I will ask here. So Sabina Great. is asking if you have any experience with uh, stem cells treatment, and if so, what are the outcomes? Okay, so so in that context, I'm actually therapeutics in terms of stem, stem cell treatments. Um, so I don't have any expertise about that. Um, I, I think uh, maybe at the end we can talk about different uh, methodologies that are, people are using to do treatments and gene therapies. I think that would be a productive discussion maybe at the at the, at the end. Um, and so I think, uh, but that's certainly not my area of expertise, but I'm happy to talk about it um, if that's helpful. Somehow I got into an annotation. Thank you. Okay, good. Here we go. Perfect. Um, so, so this shows us that it's, it's present in a wide variety of tissues throughout development. Um, but the next question we really wanted to ask is, you know, we know it's in a lot of different tissues, but where in the cell is DERK1A? Can we understand a little bit more about, you know, yes, it's in all these tissues, but what is it doing there during embryonic development? And so this is what we found. So this is, um, this is one cell here outlined here. And what you're seeing here are these, these pink things that come out of a cell that are called cilia. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about what cilia are. Um, but what you'll see here is the pink are the cilia. And DERK1A, what we're doing here is labeling the protein with this green fluorescence. And so what we're actually seeing is these, these puncta, these little spots of DERK1A along these cilia. And then also at the cell membrane um, surrounding each cell. And so cilia are a really important structure within cells. Um, in some cells, they act as a really important signaling center for one cell to talk to its neighbor cell. And in others, it really shows a, a, an important role for actually moving fluid. So in an airway, for example, it's a highly ciliated tissue and it's actually moving debris and things throughout the airway to clear it. And if there's issues with cilia, oh. that can, yeah. Sorry. Just before we, we move, like when you were saying like the two like before this one, there's a question here. If um, you notice dirk uh with the gut uh, during the development too. Uh, yes. So you can't see it quite here. It's kind of on the belly of the frog a bit here. You can see it a little bit here. And so, yes, we do see it expressed in the gut. And we think um, that um, I, I'll talk a little bit later about some of the work we're doing on DERK1A in the gut. Absolutely. That's something where we've just started, but really excited about. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we see it on cilia. And so cilia are these really important signaling centers and also these, these centers actually move material um, through the tissue. And so when cilia are effective, that can lead to a wide variety of different effects on many different organ systems. So here I'm just showing some of the organ systems that are affected by cilia. It can lead to congenital heart defects, organ laterality, respiratory problems. Again, I told you that it's in the, the lining of the, of the airways. Kidneys are really dependent on cilia, as well as the reproductive system. Um, a lot of tissues rely on cilia for their functions. <clears throat> now, the other place that we saw DERK1A when we looked in cells was on a structure called the mitotic spindle. Um, and so what we're seeing here is, um, again, green is showing us where DERK1A is, and we're labeling the mitotic spindles now 
in, in pink and the DNA is now in blue. And so when a cell goes from one cell to two cells, it has to assemble this mitotic spindle shown here in pink that actually physically separates each copy of the DNA. <coughs> Excuse me. And so that um, separation of the DNA during cell division is of course required for all cells to be able to split their DNA and go from one cell to two cell. What we see is DERK1A localizing right on the mitotic spindle during cell division. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a frog in my throat. <laughs> it's because I'm talking too much about frogs. Okay. Um, so, so, so I I've shown you two things. I've shown you that DERK1A is localizing on cilia, and I've shown you that DERK1A is also localizing on this mitotic spindle during cell division. And actually, those two structures are a lot more alike than you might think. And so both of them are dependent on a structure called microtubules. And so the cilia is full of microtubules, and that's where we see DERK1A. And then as a cell undergoes um, a cell cycle, so it goes from one cell to two cells, it assembles this, this spindle that's made up of the same kinds of proteins as the cilia to actually split these chromosomes. So what I'm showing you really is that DERK1A is localizing to this structure called microtubules, and that that's really important for both cilia and also spindles. I mean, so we think that DERK1A plays an important role in microtubules, and that's what we think is doing in the cell, right? So cilia and, my, and, and spindles, both of them share this pink structure, which is a microtubule, and that's where DERK1A is localized. So then the real question is, um, okay, so this is the typical localization of DERK1A. What happens if we inhibit DERK1A? What happens to cilia? What happens is cell division. And so this is um, a picture of one cell outlined here where we've now labeled all the cilia in pink. And this is the control situation. So this is the typical situation. And now when we inhibit DERK1A with a variety of methods, we did it in three different ways. But when we inhibit DERK1A, we see that we lose cilia. So now these cilia um, do not form in nearly the numbers as it does um, with DERK1A and they're, they're spaced irregularly, and they're not the, the typical length. I mean, so we think that the DERK1A is required for building cilia. And then here's a situation. Now what I'm showing you is um, just a zoom in on the frog's forebrain, so that top part of their brain. And again, this is that situation where I can make a half mutant tadpole. So on the left side here, you're looking at the brain um, where DERK1A has not been mutated. And on the right side, you're looking at a brain where DERK1A has been mutated, so it's a loss of function. And what you can see here is a much smaller brain region compared to the other side. And so what we're thinking is going on here is that those cell divisions are disrupted, and so that's leading to a smaller brain because the cells cannot divide at their normal frequency. Okay, so when we're thinking about stem cell therapies and things like that, this, this may be more relevant. And so one of the things we wanted to do was to take that situation I just showed you where we've mutated DERK1A on one half of the frog brain. And what we wanted to do was add back the human gene and see if that could restore brain size um, similar to on the other side. So the first thing we did was we, we added too much of the human DERK1A copy of the gene. And what you'll see here is that actually that led to a much larger brain on the side that we added DERK1A to than the other side. And so that was interesting. And of course, lots of evidence that DERK1A is highly dosage sensitive. So it matters how much is there. So this is the case where there's too much. And now what we see is a larger brain. But then if we put these two together, so if we, if we reduce the amount of frog DERK1A present, but then we add back the human version of DERK1A, now you'll see a symmetric brain where we've actually restored brain size closer to the situation that hasn't been manipulated. Okay, and so, so this is just a little bit more detail about what's going on when DERK1A is inhibited. This is the, the typical situation, the control, and then this is a situation where we've inhibited DERK1A using a chemical. And what we see is, again, with that idea about the spindles. And so what happens is that we see way too many cells stuck kind of in that phase where the spindle is trying to pull the DNA apart. They get stuck um, because they aren't able to separate their DNA properly. And so they end up 
increasing this marker of that phase of the cell cycle. And then what we see is actually then that leads to cell death. And so th there's usually a typical amount of cell death in the developing brain. But here, what we see is that in the situation where we've inhibited DERK1A, we see a massive increase in cell death. So it seems that the cells are having trouble completing cell divisions. And because of that, then they undergo cell death and that that leads to a smaller brain when DERK1A is inhibited. Okay, what about other organs? So everything I showed you so far is about the brain and, and that's really um, where uh, most of my research lies because I, I've been very interested in autism genetics historically. Um, but now we're thinking a lot more about what DERK1A is doing in even other organ systems. And so I showed you that frogs are a really nice model to do that. We don't just have to study the brain, we can do other ones. And so we recently, in collaboration with several other labs, uh, looked at what DERK1A is doing in the kidney and actually correlated that with some patients uh, who had uh, genetic congenital anomalies of the urogenital tract in kidneys. And so certainly there's um, uh, evidence that, that patients have um, um, congenital kidney issues. And so we see that also in the frogs. So when you inhibit DERK1A, the kidneys um, are, are, do not develop um, typically, and that there are um, uh, uh, various things. So I, I can send that paper out if anybody is interested in, in what that looks like in the kidney. And like I said, now we're really starting to get into the gut and the heart. And um, so because we saw that cilia localization, cilia are really important for the heart development. Um, and so loss of cilia often causes situs inversus, so complete um, transposition of the organs within the body, and also heart defects and gut looping uh, defects as well. And so now what we're doing is we're inhibiting DERK1A in those ways I've already showed you, and then looking to see what happens to the heart and also what happens to the gut. And so for both of those, both in terms of the structure of the heart and the structure of the gut, do they loop properly? Does the heart have the, the typical um, uh, aorta, uh, ventricles and different uh, valves? And then also the function. So does the heart beating uh, at the typical, or is it affected? And then also for the gut is the transit time for the gut affected as well. So that's something we're actively working on right now. And 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 you know, similar to the work that that was done in the kidney, the interfacing with um, um, patient populations, we're also interested to see if we can, if there's any evidence for these sorts of differences. In, in people with their A syndrome. And um, so we're also interested in behavior. Like I said, the frogs can move around, they can swim, they can eat. Um, and so one of the things we've been thinking about is circadian rhythm. Um, and so that's, you know, uh, being more active during the day and less active at night or vice versa. And in frogs, they're very much like humans. They are more active during the day and they're less active at night. And so we can actually measure that in our frogs I mean, what we can do is we can look at what it looks like in the typical control situation. And what you'll see is during the day, they're more active and at night they're less active. And then the next day they're more active during the day, they're less active at night. And they have this rhythmical pattern, uh, typical of our circadian rhythm. But actually what we see is that when we inhibit DERK1A, around the time that we've mapped frog development to human development being birth, what actually happens is these, uh, these you know, modified patterns of circadian rhythm go away. And actually what we see is hyperactivity that persists over several days. Um, and so this is definitely some new work that we're working on, um, but what we wanna know is, is can we find small molecules that can restore these circadian rhythms? Um, what, what neural circuits are underlying these differences? Um, and things like that. But we, we do see circadian rhythm differences after DERK1A inhibition. Okay, so the last um, quick story I wanna share is what we're doing with drug screening. Um, and so, like I told you, we get 4,000 embryos in an afternoon. And so what we wanted to do was take one of those batches, um, add a DERK1A inhibitor. So just to, to everybody, inhibit DERK1A. And then on top of that, add individually 133 oncology compounds. So oncology compounds often function at cilia and spindles, since those are often structures that are, are affected um, during cancer. And so what we did was add those on top and see, you know, did it make what we were looking at more severe or did it make it less severe? 
And this is a very complicated graph, so I'm not going to go through it. I'm happy to talk to people about it at the end if they're interested. This is the control. And what we saw with Dirk 1A was it increased this thing we were looking at in the brain. And so we asked, you know, are there any drugs that either made it better, made it closer to the control, or are there things that made it even more severe? So it made, they were enhancers, they enhanced the effect. I mean, what we found was that we hit the estrogen pathway four times. So these are all inhibitors of estrogen signaling that made the, the effect more severe. And this is also um, an estrogen uh, activator. And that made the phenotype more closer to the control situation. And so now um, a whole part of our lab is starting to think about estrogen pathway, what it's doing during brain development and other organ systems of development, and how that might intersect the function of um, DERK 1A and also other autism risk genes um, and uh, provide some insight into the effect of estrogen signaling. Now, in no way am I saying that estrogen is a potential therapeutic target, because of course there are way too many side effects in terms of sexual differentiation. But for example, what we're doing now is understanding, you know, what's downstream of estrogen, what is estrogen doing in the cell that makes this better than, um, or, you know, closer to the typical situation than a drug one a inhibition alone. And um, to start to get a handle on actionable biology that actually might potentially be a therapeutic. Okay, so just to summarize, and then please ask me as many questions and, and, and let's chat, you know, so what, what I showed you is that human and, and frog DERK 1A sequences at the protein level are very similar and that human and frog development is probably a lot more similar than you ever thought you really have an inner frog. Um, and that and what we've what we've been looking at is where is DERK 1A on and what we're seeing is in a wide variety of organs throughout the body during embryogenesis so that process of um, before birth. And we found that DERK 1A is important for cilia, those signaling centers and those movement centers in the cell, and also its spindles, which are important for cell division. Um, and I assure you that many organs and also behavior are affected by DERK 1A loss. And so we're starting to think about not just the brain, but also now the gut and the heart. And we've done some work on the kidney. Um, and what I showed you was some drug screening identified uh, that estrogen actually makes DERK 1A loss less severe. So now we're starting to think about what exactly estrogen is doing and how does it do that? And is that some sort of handle we could have to understand a little bit more? Okay, so with that, I, I, I have to acknowledge a lot of people. Um, I'm in, a, in the laboratory at Matthew State at UCSF. I have a lot of fellow froggers. I have a lot of collaborators. We have a wonderful thing called the Psychiatric Cell Map Initiative, which is really focused on autism, Tourette disorder, OCD, ADHD. And so we're thinking about these kinds of strategies in many different systems and in human sense stem cell models to try to understand what these genes do during development and gain more insight into psychiatric disorders. Uh, we have funding from the NIMH um, and wonderful collaborators. And most importantly, I wanna thank you all for coming today. And, and I hope I can learn um, so much from from y'all over the years and that that um, I can attend and, and listen and learn as much as possible um, because that really is um, a big goal of mine. So thank you so much for having me. My email is here. If people don't feel comfortable asking right now, shoot me an email. I love chatting on email, um, but I'm also happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Maybe I'll stop sharing. Oh, thank you, stop. Helen. Uh, it's I'm amazed. Like it's it's really nice to to learn, especially like start to seeing uh, things that we see in the community, right? The, the question about gut that come from uh, China and like things that we see in our kids all the time to kind of yeah. uh, validate that in the development where uh, Dirkone is affecting. So thank you. Um, so everybody. Uh, the the microphone can be unmuted, so you are welcome to ask question um, yourselves, or please put in the chat, and I will get here from you. While people are thinking on their questions, um, I have I one can, one question. Ahead. Oh, you have to go ahead, Anna. Go go ahead. Oh, my question was: I have it in monitoring our Facebook site. I know in my daughter, and in, in particular, she is five. I haven't seen many kidney issues with her, but you're saying there's a lot in frogs, and I'm wondering if anyone has had the, those issues with their um, their kids with DYRK one A, or what kind of issues should we be maybe looking out for? We don't notice. I don't know. 
Yeah, so so there is one paper describing it in a patient population about um, congenital anomalies of the kidney and urogenital tract. Um, and so that's a that's a paper by um, uh, Alexandria Blackburn um, on our Amy, I can send you that paper. Um, and so that actually describes what they've seen and it, it um, in the patient population they had, which I think was 19 people with Dirkwine syndrome. Um, I think almost all of them had one of these um, 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 differences. And so um, I'll refer you to, to that paper. And that's where we we did some of the frog work in that paper where we could validate that, yes, we see similar things in the frogs to what's been described in, in the clinic. So I'll send that paper out. Um, I, I'm not a clinician. I don't know a lot about what congenital anomalies of the kidney and urogenital tract looks like, um, but that's what it's called. So CAGUCT, I'll send you the paper. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be curious to to read more of this this paper. Like, and um, uh, I I didn't notice anything in Luna for for kidney, but uh, Luna is four, so really close to to the same age of your daughter. Um, but one thing that I noticed the the doctor didn't pay too much attention on it, but uh, us being curious, right? Like every time that we do some blood test. There's some numbers that are not quite in the normal area. Uh, then when I was doing my Google uh, research about it, they have to do with kidney. So um, it kind of prompted me, especially now, to to go back to the doctors and ask about it, since we know uh, something can can go on. We have another question here from Janet. Like, uh, is estrogen the same as oh? O estrogen? Yes, there's different, there's many different names for estrogen. Um, they share a lot of the same, um, either the exact same compound or very similar or can be metabolized in the same thing. So sometimes you'll hear it called O estrogen. Sometimes you'll hear it called estradiol. Sometimes you'll hear it called 17 beta estradiol. And so a lot of people call it different things and they may have slightly different chemical structures, um, but in many cases they'll act on the same kinds of um, uh, pathways. In the UK, is that the same thing? Ah, yeah. right. <laughs> so the, the the sex hormones that we think of as during pregnancy and during female, female sexual yeah. development, um, same thing. Mm, interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, love to see those in small language too, UK and uh, US, and um, always learn that. Uh, I, I have a question myself. Like when you talk about the the estrogen as like kind of the, the pathway that is working. So if uh, if if I understood right, is work on the pathways and how it can um make the make the issue with like less dirquane um less like it is is helping but is not exactly um work on like kind of make more dirquane or like kind of revert or is, is that right? It's like more. Yeah, yes, yes. So, so when we think about therapeutics or gene therapy or drugs and things like that, um, there's many different ways to do it, right? And so this gets back at that kind of stem cell question. So maybe I can talk about the different ways that people are thinking about it and the advantages and disadvantages of all of it. So, um, of course, with Dirk one a it can be an increase in the amount of Dirk one a um, in, in an affected child. It also can be a decrease in the amount of Dirk one a And so one area of idea about therapeutics is to either add back Dirk one a itself Itself, or, you know, in the case where there's too much is, is to reduce the amount of Dirk 1A. Um, and so that's where you, you start to think about um, therapeutic strategies like, like gene delivery, um, gene therapy, uh, antisense oligonucleotides, those sorts of ideas about actually changing the levels of Dirk 1A present. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to those kinds of uh, therapies and, you know, they would have to be targeted to a particular gene. Um, and delivery is a bit difficult because you actually have to deliver, you know, DNA or RNA, and that's a lot harder than giving somebody, you know, an oral medication. Um, another way to think about it is that stem cell idea that was brought up earlier. So could you um, replace the stem cells? Um, um, and so instead of, you know, so in an affected child, maybe there's less Dirk1A, but you could add in stem cells. 
um, that have a typical amount of DERK 1A and see if those can populate organs that really need DERK 1A to function and compensate in those sorts of ways. And so that's very new biology. I think it's still very premature. And there's a lot of people who want to say that it's uh, prime time. Um, I'm not one of those people. I think there's a lot still to learn about adding stem cells. And, and there is now a big field about people um, taking cells from a, a patient, modifying back the gene of interest and, and replacing those. And so those have been very successful for blood disorders because in that case, we're used to, you know, it's a mobile thing. You can irradiate the blood. You can replace it. We know how to do that. Um, and so for blood disorders, that's definitely prime time. For other organ systems, we're not quite there. Um, there's some exciting new work now in eyes and, and gene replacement and stem cell replacement for eyes. Um, so that's coming online. Um, but for other tissues like kidneys, liver, it's a bit harder to do. But I definitely think it, it, it will happen in the future um, with the right regulations. And then, the, of course, the last and most traditional method is to have a drug. Um, something that can be delivered orally or an injection or um, an infusion, something like that. Um, and so that in many cases is the most convenient and sit, you know, a uh, less complicated way to do it. And um, but that that will not actually, so this estrogen thing I talked about, that will not actually itself increase the amount of DERK 1A. What it will do is it will compensate downstream of DERK 1A. So you can imagine if DERK 1A is normally required to turn something on, what you could do is and then you lose Dirk 1A, so that thing goes off. Instead of affecting Dirk 1A, you could just cut to the chase, get to that downstream thing, and have a drug that actually increases that itself. And so that's what we're thinking that estrogen is doing. It's not actually increasing Dirk 1A per se, but it's acting on the same downstream effector that Dirk 1A is. Make sense? Yeah, thank you. Um, in the same, there's another question here uh, in the chat. Uh, so would it be useful to the oncology drug? Was there, uh, oh, no, hold on. So it'd be useful for us uh, all to get oestrogen hormone level established and compared to normal level uh, of a child with the agent sex? So, so it's, it's not, so um, that's a very interesting question. I wouldn't go out and do that. I don't think it will necessarily be informative. Um, so I think what's happening and at least our frog situation is we're adding a lot more estrogen in. Um, and so we're adding non physiological way too much estrogen onto these frogs and getting this compensatory effect. Um, and so I don't think that necessarily hormone levels will be different. In um, you know a Dirk One A uh, syndrome situation, um, and so I don't think that you would necessarily pick it up. Um, I also haven't looked, so I don't really know um, if people find that. But for some other reason, I would be interested in that. Um, but um, of course, you know, hormone levels are very different between males and females, so that difference already exists. So um, I don't know. It's a, I'm going to think a lot more about that now. That's a really interesting <laughs> question. I don't know. Thank you. Um, there's another question here. When you looked at the oncology drugs, was there anything else of interesting apart from the estrogen ones you were uh, unidentified? Yeah, great yeah. question. And so we we just published this work. So it's in it's it was just published in Neuron. Um, I, I sent the paper to Amy, but I'm happy to send it to anybody else who wants to look at that full list. And um, the the we hit a couple other pathways that were interesting. So one was on microtubules, which at that time we didn't know that Dirk One A was uh, on microtubules. So it's kind of a nice validation that that it really is where Dirk One A is acting. And so the you know in, in cancer, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll um, target cells that are highly dividing. And so what they'll do is they'll stabilize the microtubules and kind of freeze them and so that those cells die, right? And so that's one particular way that um, many people treat cancer. Um, and so one of the drugs was one of those drugs that affects how that spindle can form and segregate. Um, and so that um, that um, definitely affected it um, and is again about this spindle idea. And then um, uh, the other pathway that was hit was um, uh, these drugs that are called PARP inhibitors, P-A-R-P inhibitors. I mean, so um, those made it better 
um, uh, those really um, affect cell death. And so I think what was happening is that it was keeping the cells from dying and so that the cells would survive longer. Now, that's not always kind of what you want um, because if the spindles are having trouble separating DNA um, and, and maybe they, they separate the DNA incorrectly, that's going to introduce mutations. Um, and so you kind of want those cells um, um, to die in many sense because um, otherwise they could lead to tumors or um, um, kind of bigger problems about um, 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 introducing new mutations. Um, and so I think those PARP inhibitors are less promising going forward because really what it was doing was blocking cell death. Um, and it, so so I, uh, while that's an interesting way to compensate, I think in terms of therapeutics, I think estrogen is a lot more promising and sort of understanding what it's doing um, since that, that um, seemed to not just affect cell death, but actually the ability of these neurons to develop. You, see if there's any other question coming here. I got all from the chat. Anybody have more more question? Oh, just one more. So, is there oh, a I way? Should just, I should just type my questions, Anna. Sorry. No, no, no. Uh, go ahead. It's welcome. So it's not just me talking. <laughs> Uh, no, thank you. And I, I like saying questions. I think it's more personal, but um, I guess more curiosity than anything. Like, just asking, like your specialty. Um, the way I introduce sometimes, like my daughter or like her problems when people ask, is that she just had some random mutation on a genetic hotspot, which is happens to be the DYRK1A gene. Um, and we all have mutation to just some affect our development, and hers was on that hotspot. And I'm just wondering, is that kind of like your folk? It sounds like you do a lot of autism research with a DYRK1A gene. Is that kind of, would you say that's your specialty, or do you like so you study like Down syndrome and all the other things too, or or like your his your background in understanding the DYRK1A gene? Yeah, so so I think how you've described it is such a perfect way to describe it. We are all walking around with what are called de novo variants. And so those were variants that happen maybe during the formation of egg or sperm or shortly after, and we all have some. Um, and so it just depends on where they land in terms of what happens next, right? And so I think that's a perfect way to describe it. Um, and so is that my specialty? So certainly um, the genes I study are all, all hot spots. Um, so they're genes where um, uh, each one of them carries a very large effect when varied. Um, so like you said, um, um, I, I focus on the ones that when they're varied lead to autism most of the time. But as you all know, with Dirk 1A, it's not just always autism. There, there can be other, um, a whole syndrome associated with each gene, right? And so I study genes like ADNP, which now there's a whole syndrome for ADNP. And it's the same thing. You know, we picked it up because it was... It was um, highly causative for autism, but kids with ADMP syndrome have a whole um, spectrum of, of different um, um, characteristics. I mean, so a lot of those genes are the kinds of genes that I study. And so um, historically I've been studying the ones that are autism related, but now starting to get into Tourette disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, ADHD, um, some other psychiatric disorders too. Okay, let's get some others here from the uh, chat. Um, so is there a way that we can take forward getting some of these drugs trialed? Uh, yeah, so I mean, the, um, obviously we always have our eyes on sort of how can we actually fast track this information? Um, and so part of this that I ha didn't tell you about today is um, what we then did with estrogen, for example, is we went into human stem cells um, and inhibited jerk one a in human neurons in a dish and then added estrogen and said, does that make it better? And it did. Um, and so that's kind of one of the first things you do to kind of just make sure that what we're seeing in the frog has also had some parallels in human cells. Um, and, and so that worked. Um, and so I think the next idea is saying, okay, well, we can't really use estrogen per se. You know, you don't want to you know, treat prepubescent pre or young or even older people necessarily with, with estrogen since it has so many um, effects on sexual differentiation and, and sexual function. And um, so then what we wanted to do was understand what it does 
during development. And we figured out that what it does is inhibit a pathway called sonic hedgehog signaling, which is a bizarre name. And it's a historical from fly work. Fly people are very quirky and like to call things, it's called genes, different weird names about what it looks like in the fly. Anyways, it's called sonic hedgehog signaling. And that's what estrogen inhibits. Um, and um, that's what we're going forward with now is starting to understand what sonic hedgehog is doing and intersecting with DERK1A and, and how can we fine tune that more, right? We can't even target sonic hedgehog signaling because sonic hedgehog signaling is involved in sort of embryonic development of all tissues. It's the reason why your thumb looks different than your, than your pinky. And so again, that's not really a potential therapeutic. And so now we're trying to get more and more specific. So what's downstream of sonic hedgehog signaling? Is that specific to different tissues? Is that, can we make that more targeted to DERK1A? And do that. So we still need to do some of that background research before we're able to think about trialing different drugs. Great, thank you. Um, so another question from uh, Jana: Is a reference to the gut is specific uh, in, in reference to the gut specifically, but also all other organs you are looking at? Are you tracking the difference with just the uh, neurons or is structurally as well? Great question, both. Um, and so I don't know which one it is yet with the gut. Um, and so so what we're doing right now with the gut is, and we're not only looking at, and so in frogs, the gut has this really cool looping that it does. And, and you imagine the human gut, it does the same kind of looping pattern, right? And so what we're looking first is, is there structural differences? So does it not loop the stereotypical way? And so cilia are really important for how it loops. And so we may see structural difference in how the um, gut forms. But then also there's an entire web of neurons around the entire gut that is talking between the brain and the gut that's called the enteric nervous system. I um, mean, so what we're also doing is looking at those neurons and you know, they, they oftentimes help sort of gut motility and traffic through the gut. And so we're starting to think about not only how the gut forms structurally, but also how the neurons are actually talking to the gut and is that different or dependent on DERK1A. So both, and, and for the heart as well, we're looking at structural defects, left-right asymmetry, because again, that's a cilia thing, how the, how the actual structure of the heart forms, but then also again, thinking about how the nervous system um, comes in and affects that as well. So both, not quite there yet. We're close though. I think in the next month or two, we'll know more. And I've been talking to Amy a little bit, you know, this idea of, um, you know, should I look at my child for kidney problems? Like, could that have been missed, right? That's really one of my big goals is to say, here's what we see in the frog. Here's what the total spectrum of the complete loss of DERK1A function looks like, right? So then, then people know what to go out and look for and ask a doctor to go look for, because I think um, that's essential knowledge to actually be able to intervene in a meaningful way and know know what to look for. So I've talked to Amy a little bit about whether or not we can think about sending out um, a survey to understand if people have seen kidney kidney differences in their children. How prevalent is that? Or do you not know, right? I think that information is going to be critical going forward. I know when you talked about the, the gut and the brain and they're in between, when I explained to people how my son, when he needs to use the bathroom, it's like he doesn't know until right when he has to go. So it's yeah. like a dash to the restroom. And I'm like, he just doesn't feel it. It does the signal. Something's uh -huh. wrong there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so hopefully we'll know a little bit more about what that looks like in the frog. I hope really in the next few months that research is moving very quickly. And so, so, so maybe I can keep Amy and Anna updated on that. Um, and, and that's something we're going to be doing drug screening on pretty fast. Um, I think that's one where there are a lot of potential drugs that could be helpful in terms of um, either moving through the gut or getting those cues about, about bowel movements. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. I, I'm getting more and more excited not to hear uh, from you in the future, but uh, guessing we are going to invite you to talk here in the future again with us. Anytime. <laughs> um, let's see. So have you uh, studied more major, um, oh, no. have you studied more ma major frogs to compare how their Kone levels affect behavior? Oh, that's so something we want to do. So, um, uh, we haven't done it. It's something now that, um, as I transition to starting my independent laboratory, something we'll be doing a lot more of, um, 
for some of the autism genes, we've made these mutations and a lot of the sort of more, um, more complex behaviors like mating is still fine with one copy of the gene, um, two copies of the gene, it can be disrupted. Um, but uh, definitely something we want to do. We want to make full mutant lines. Um, so what we're doing is like we're transiently inhibiting the gene. I um, mean, so to do these sort of longer term experiments, we need to actually make a mutant line and, and through development. But we haven't done it, and it's something I'm I'm planning to do for sure. Have you heard anything about reproduction? Like, so when somebody asks, them, my son's now turning eighteen and interesting in girls and stuff and I'm thinking are they ever going to have babies and what does that yeah. look like and yeah. does have you, is there been any studies on the transmission from a Dirk 1A to to their offspring yeah I so I think um, I think you've got two questions there really one is sort of um, uh, what what's going on with reproduction uh, is is there any evidence that there are differences there or is that um, um, typical and the second being like a more genetic counselor question of what are the odds to keep going, right? And so for the first question about reproductive system, I don't know. We haven't looked in the frogs. I'm um, definitely something we want to do. Cilia are definitely important in the reproductive system, especially for um, fallopian tubes and also for sperm. Um, and so there definitely could be something there. Um, it's not something I've looked at yet, but definitely something I want to. But that, you know, the frogs don't have gonads at the stages that we've been looking at. And so we'd have to grow them up longer. So that's one of those longer term experiments that we're thinking about doing. Um, but again, I think it'd be interesting. And, and because you all have such a wonderful cohort um, of families to think about whether or not um, um, people have experiences in that realm, um, that would be interesting to think about. I mean, in terms of passing it on, you know, it, it, that will be a case by case situation in terms of what is the nature of the difference. Um, you know, is it an, a two inherited cases in which um, there's two alleles or is it just one, one sort of de novo event, then that's usually 50 50 in the offspring, but I am not a genetic counselor, nor am I anywhere qualified to give any sort of advice. So I will, I will definitely punt that question. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, uh, GI. People like are very to... interested in GI. Is that the thing that's like the mo that that's on people's brains? Is GI issues? That is that one of the more challenging aspects? I think there's a definitely a lot of GI stuff, um, yeah. and and maybe um, what I'm what I'm just kind of uh, maybe thinking you know out loud here is that uh, maybe the kidney and the um, uh, the kidney or the, what is, how did you say that? The gas? Yeah, urogenital tract, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe those are less obvious as to what is um, happening, at trans transferring over to the humans versus the frogs, right? Um, maybe it's less obvious, like, um, uh, like Carol was saying, maybe it's more of, uh, you know, using the bathroom and, you know, um, but, the GI issues, I think, are are much more obvious. Like, um, yeah. definitely, chronic constipation is, is um, one of the um, common ones. But then also just uh, the eating, and we we often wonder what's happening there. Is there um, a slow motility going on there, or what's going on? Right, and um, and it looks a little different for you know some of the families. Yep. Um, so, um, and so it's, uh, more of a, a bigger issue for some of the families and less, um, for some of the families, but the same is true for say kidneys, obviously, um, for some it's a, it's, um, a more obvious and more, uh, need to be dealt with type of situation. And there's even some families with, uh, significant heart defects, um, right. whereas some of them are much more mild. Um, that no, don't need a, um, a more a significant surgery. Um, so it's just a matter of that that the normal differences in the syndromes and severity. So yeah. Yeah. absolutely. But I wanted to say thank you so much because I uh, did listen to the the one <laughs> the the video on you speaking huh. to kind of the sciencey people and I could totally get so much more out of 
you speaking with the family. So, so appreciate it. <laughs> I, I much prefer this format. It's much more my speed. The scientific talks get lost in the jargon. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm really glad this will be on YouTube. Uh, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to learn from you all um, and to tell you about what we've been doing. It's really important to me. We have one other question here. Um, our kids also uh, have a, a very, oh, I have uh, some vision. Just an, yeah, very yeah. tough vision problems. Any specific finds about vision? Yeah, so we definitely see a smaller eye when we inhibit Dergwinae during embryonic development. Um, again, the eye is a highly ciliated tissue, is also has a um, really needs a lot of cell divisions to form. Um, and so uh, it makes sense to me that there may be some visions problems um, because of those two regions, cilia and spindles are really important for eye development. Um, and, and yes, in the frogs, we do see a smaller eye. Thank you. What about with uh, seizures? Because I know some in our list of things, there's seizures, some that um, are happening quite young and then others that continue on with seizures. Um, anything about that? Uh, yeah, I would be really interested to learn more about that. So we haven't seen seizures. We also haven't looked. Um, and so definitely something I'll be thinking about as we grow the, the frogs out um, later. Um, and so, um, you know, in, for many of these autism genes, at least, what seems to be the case is that um, a loss of function, so an inhibition or a reduced amount, of the gene will lead to autism and, and various different developmental delays, whereas a gain of function to much of the gene will lead to seizures. Um, and so I would be curious about whether those instances are, are an increase in Dirk1A. I don't know. Um, I haven't seen seizures, but I also haven't looked. And then so I'll, um, I'll definitely keep that on my radar now that you brought it up. So thank you. Uh, just to follow Zero's um, question on that is um, uh, so a lot of a lot of our kids and, and this has been noted in some of the research papers is um, that the seizures are often start with uh, febrile seizures. Um, so I was just curious how would you how would you how would that present as far as fever in frogs? Like how would that? I, I'm just curious. Could you even see anything like that? I don't know. <laughs> That's such a great question. And really <laughs> exposes how little I know about the temperature regulation of frogs. Um, <laughs> I have no idea what that would look like in a frog. Uh, I gotta think about that. They usually get their temperature, I guess, from the water. So it may be a different scenario in terms of whether or not they can actually get fevers. I don't know. Um, there's certainly a lot of studies that have looked at seizures in frogs and um, not, not febrile seizures, but seizures in general. Um, usually there are situations where the neurons have trouble um, in a process called differentiation. And we certainly see that in Dirk one the, the neurons, like I said, they, they're having trouble dividing. And so they're having trouble maturing into mature neurons. I mean, so that same process of differentiation is affected when Dirk one is lost. And so I think that could definitely be a mechanism that could lead to seizures. And I think it would depend on the particular variant within Dirk one in, uh, in terms of whether or not that happens. You know, some different places in Dirk one are gonna be more severe than others in terms of what they look like in a child. And um, um, I think, uh seizures yeah that, that, that i haven't looked at it i don't know what it looks like in a frog gee bro i gotta learn about temperature in frogs <laughs> They're cold -blooded. that's embarrassing i wanted to just say something that, sorry i kept interrupting everyone um about like you mentioned like what's on everyone's mind and the kidney is something new for me and i, I totally will be looking into that but what's on my mind and with my daughter right now She's five, she's developing um, her language. She understands a lot more than she can express and also her method of learning, like what is effective and how to teach her. Because like with my uh, typical kids, you know, they can watch someone kick the ball. Oh, I know how to kick the ball, I copy him. But with my daughter, what I found works best is it's the PTs, the OTs, the therapists. They get in there one-on-one, -on -one, um, maybe whatever kind of therapy. And she, with that muscle movement memory, it's like when she does it, then she learns it. If she cannot watch and, and learn it from others. So um, so that's like, as far as like your research and all, I'm sure probably haven't gone into that at all, but like that's that's really on my heart is 
because once I understand my daughter and she can communicate to me, it opens up a whole new door of, oh, so, you know, you're having stomach issues. Now we can treat them and, and all that stuff. So I just wanted to say that's huge to me. Yeah. What a wonderful thing to share. Thank you. And I think about that idea of how to communicate and how to learn, I think are really critical issues. And I don't know if I'm going to get there with the frogs, um, but I think, you know, thinking about how, you know, how, how do we watch somebody do something and then know how to do it, right? I have no idea. I think that's a really interesting to think about and, and, and you know, how important communication can be and how do we do more of it in different ways, right? I'll be thinking about that for a while. Thank you for sharing. And I think when what you brought up with the expressive it's amazing that you try to tell other people that they understand, like my son, he understands mm -hmm. so much more. And you can see his process, he's thinking about it, but when he tries and he gets frustrated, it's like, I, I know what's in there, I wanna get it out, but it's just, and, and then eventually he'll give up on someone. He just can't get it out for them to understand. But he knows what he wants to say, he just can't say it. So you can see the brain working, yeah. Yeah, you know, one of these genes that have, has gotten a lot of press around language and communications, um, it's called FOXP1. Um, people are interested in reading about that gene. And people thought for a long time that it was doing something very different than DERK1A. I have a lot of unpublished data um, that actually says it's doing a lot of the similar things as DERK1A. Um, and so I think, you know, understanding FOXP1 and I'll think more about that, because that's really been sort of a language communication gene. It's been hyped up a lot. Um, but what I'll tell you is I think there's a lot more similarities with Dirk 1A than people know. Um, so that might be an interesting one to read about. What's that called? Fox? Fox. I guess I guess these stupid science names. F O X Fox P as in Peter one. Okay. So a lot of sort of pop science articles about it that might be interested to read. People are calling it a language gene and things like that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, and then you have a Facebook site. I'm not on Facebook. So, Amy, if it's okay with you, I'm going to send you a bunch of papers. And if you want to link them on Facebook, the ones I talked to you about today, I'll just send you PDFs or links or whatever. That's yeah. a good um, comment. Uh, the comment about the paper about the eye development uh, in their uh, This is a study that was done in the UK. Uh, we plan to, to invite them. Uh, just for you guys to know, we plan to invite them to to speak here with us, so we can all uh, ask questions and understand a little bit more. But in that said, it's is research, and I have to thank you uh, the families that did share their input to to make the, the research available, because we we all need each other, right? The uh, we need the science; uh, they need the information from us, so. Uh, I know sometimes research sharing the questionnaires and the stuff can be a lot because a lot of questions, a lot of things that we need to answer and in interviews. But uh, I would suggest everybody, if you can, put some time there, share their perspective, because that's the only way that we're going to be uh, able to learn more and to understand more of our kids if we can get the power of all of us together sharing the information and participating in research. Uh, right now that I'm aware, we have uh, a research that's still collecting information in Australia about speech. So if you did not get a chance to uh, participate uh, in our website, there's more information how to, to get in contact. And they have the questionnaire available in many languages. So if you are not so comfortable with English, there's a lot of other language there um, to contact. And also Simon Searchlight, um, that's also is still collecting information um, from from patient. They do have Spanish. They do have some other language too. So all those new research you can find in dirkwane.org. Uh, and even though it can be many, it can be like a lot of like different uh, questionnaires to answer. I feel like that's the way that we're gonna learn. So uh, spend some time there. Any other questions? Well, with that, 
Um, I thank you, uh, Dr. Helen, uh, for being with us here on a Saturday, answer your question. Thank you for the families. And please keep um, all connect to each other on Facebook, on um, the dearconnect.org, the um, mail, subscribe yourself. And we'll talk soon in another event. Thank you so much for having me. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Have a great uh, rest of your day. You too. Okay, it's brilliant. Thank you, everybody. Daniel O'Neill, FaceTime video.